Okay. Good morning. Uh, uh, actually, is it good morning or good evening right now? Well, now it's good evening. I thought the difference in the hours was a bit... Uh, I thought it now should be around midnight. I wasn't aware of the, exactly the difference of hours. Well, well, good... You know, quarter to one, but it's right. probably... Uh, well, you look great, uh, Dr. Barron, and... Um, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for the people at the Wiesenthal Center and hopefully Shari Tzedek and around the world to uh, get a bit of an update. I'm just going to ask you a, a, a few uh, questions. Uh, maybe a good place to start is, can you tell us now what your average day is like? Explain to us why you're there and what's going on. So, um, as everyone knows, the tsunami hit the Barely uh, the east coast of Japan about three weeks ago, um, and really the east coast was severely devastated. And about, as far as we know, about 40, 45 countries approached Japan, um, asking, uh, offering, I'm sorry, their uh, assistance. And for many reasons, which I, of course, I don't know the exact reason, but it turned out that Israel was the only one that they approved uh, that we will come. So we are really the only international uh, group, group coming uh, to give assistance here. Um, we, we decided to assemble our unit in a small village called Minami Sanriku. That's a small village on the east, northern east coast of uh, Japan. It's a, a village that used to have 17,000 people living in it. Uh, and the tsunami, unfortunately, well, the village was, was totally wiped off, but of course the disaster is really that half of the people of this, uh, of this village uh, died, unfortunately. Um, so, first of all, as opposed to Haiti last year, we came here to what is called the second phase, meaning we didn't come to treat directly the injuries from the tsunami. I must say that, to our surprise, the tsunami is almost what I would call an all or none. The, the village is wiped off. And, and the people either died or survived. There were not a lot of people that were injured. I mean, it's not like in Haiti that we saw a lot of uh, people that were injured with trauma and we had to treat them. As I started to say, we are we are treated what is called the second phase, meaning we are treating the refugees. So in our area, there is about I don't know 8,000 refugees from this village that are concentrated in. In, 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 in compounds, in, in I'm sorry, evacuation centers, in, in size of uh, between 100 to 1500 people in each one of these centers. Uh, the Japanese people are amazingly uh, organized, so things are, are, are moving very quickly. And so people have these centers where they have a place to sleep, they, they're getting food, they're getting clothes. I mean, people just lost everything. People have come there just as they are everything they lost. So they're getting their basic needs, and they have in these centers small clinics. So there are Japanese physicians uh, giving them their basic medicine. What Israel offers, and this is what, uh, after our small forward team uh, decided to assemble here, is mostly a um, clinic. So what we have here is a few things. First of all, we have an area where we are uh, assisting with a small and um, uh, Speciality clinics. We have physicians which they don't have here, like uh, ear, nose, and throat, ophthalmology, neurology, orthopedics, infectious disease. So we brought one physician of each one of the subspecialties. So this is something that we can give them. The second thing is that we brought a lab to do some blood tests, which again, for a large population in the area, there's no possibility to do blood tests. And the third thing, is as we brought imaging facilities, we have an X-ray machine and we have ultrasound. So one part, one important part of our job here is to give, is to do, um, is to is to treat patients who are arriving to our clinic. Uh, these are usually uh, uh, arriving with their own physicians. I mean, they have their primary physician, which needs either lab work, X-rays, or a consult from anyone of our specialists. So he comes with with his patient. These are most of the patients come with their own physicians. So as I started to say, this is part of our job. But the other part of our job is that we are sending small teams outside of our compound to either other small compounds to assist patients to see if they need anything, if they need blood tests, if they need to bring patients.
patients and so on. And we are even sending our uh, gynecologist with a midwife and with the ultrasound machine almost from house to house to the pregnant woman. The, the, the situation now is getting much better, but I must say that in the first days there was a big issue of gasoline, so people could not really travel around. And I think this small group did, did a lot of good because it gives the pregnant lady a lot of comfort that the gynecologist comes to her house uh, with the ultrasound machine and tells her, tells her that everything is okay. He did encounter one or two issues with the woman and he had to, to, to refer them for uh, treatment. But generally speaking, even if you come to a pregnant lady and, and you examine her and you do it so and say that everything is okay, I think this is... This is a big comfort. It's a big, uh, it's a big help to these uh, ladies. So we really are, are, are trying to be as flexible as we can in order to to do our work in different in different means in different ways, either in our clinic or to go out. Well, I've been to Japan many times, and I know that uh, the Japanese people are generally very reserved uh, and uh, respectful, but reserved. Can you describe some of the interactions? or reactions by the Japanese people when they see uh, Israelis uh, in, in the midst of their lives? So I must say that this is one of the most surprising things. You know, when we're speaking within us, and I guess that you, this, most of them know that, uh, that Israelis are very easy going, you know, with other people and so on. But we were talking what would happen, God forbid, if something like this would happen in Israel, in a smaller country, and of course Israel to Japan is a very small country, what would happen if some group from, I don't know, Africa or South America will come? Will we as Israelis be very easy to come to position and speak a different language? Or will we say, no, we have our own position? So we expected for two reasons. One is what I said, and the other thing, exactly as you are saying, it's, it's a cultural and mean in Japan. It's not trivial at all that they will go to a foreign uh, physician. So as I started to say, this is extremely surprising. They, they very quickly um, give trust in us. Uh, they are they're coming either by their own or their own physicians. They, they talk, they, they speak quite a lot about their emotions as well, uh, which again for us was surprising. I mean, this is a small village, so, so, so a lot of these people lost their parents, their spouses, their children, and most of these people have, have, have been, decided on diseases, have, have mental trauma, and, and, they're, and they're quite easy talking about it. And so from this sense, um, we had to put a lot of effort into coordinating the right way with the Japanese people. I mean, from the beginning, we put it straight on the table that in no way we're trying to compete with them. Japanese physicians who just came to assist. So the basic idea that we are working under the supervision of the Japanese people, we have a coordinator okay, within our team sitting with us and seeing the patients. We are, we, are, we are very cautious about giving Israel medications to them because we want to make sure that they have the exact same medications in uh, Japan. So all, all the efforts are coordinated with them. It's made really with full cooperation and I think that being trying to be humble, but I think that, 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 that our team in, in general was smart enough to do this very delicate diplomatic way how to put ourselves in, and I think from this sense that uh, our work here is a big success. Can you tell me your first, very first impression when you arrived uh, into this uh, area? What did you see? What were you expecting to see? You know, I have experience from the earthquake of last year in Nevi. It is such a difference. I mean, we, we stay during the night because our clinic doesn't work at night in, in town, a bit further away from the coast, which was not damaged. I mean, it was an earthquake in the scale of nine on the Richter scale, which is a huge earthquake. But the houses in Japan are built perfectly for even this uh, earthquake in this scale. So the whole area where we are um, staying during the night Everything looks perfect. Everything looks normal. So you drive into this village, and then it's like in one second, everything changes. You, when, you, when you go down, 
sorry, the hill, within five meters, it's between normal and completely devastating. Everything, there's nothing left in this village. It's like really someone described it as a village that undergone an atomic bombing. It, this is how it looks. Everything is, 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 is wiped off. Everything, you know, I have a picture of the car which is sitting on a three-story building. The car is sitting on top of this building. So, I mean, I don't know how you think, but we always had the feeling, okay, tsunami is a big wave. Okay, we are young and strong. I will swim out. I mean, this, we have, I have a picture of a bridge, a steel bridge, which was broken. So the force, nature, the force of this tsunami is something that really, I think, even if you see movies, if, even if you see in, in pictures, you, you cannot imagine it until you, you just sit over there and, and you see the whole area, which is white. As far as your cuisine, uh, we know about the concerns over uh, radiation now. That's still a big question mark. What are you eating and drinking? What are, you, what are your conditions like? So I think one of the pre-requests of the Japanese, and maybe this is one of the reasons that the Israeli team came here, one of the requests was that every team will come as a self-sufficient team, meaning that we have our own logistics. Everything was brought from Israel, first of all because of the kosher uh, issue, second of all maybe because of the radiation issue, and third, as I said, because the, the, the Japanese doesn't, didn't need anyone to come and impose another burden on right. their resources. I mean, they don't need a team to come and say, okay, now bring us cars, give us food, a place to sleep. Everything is, is made by their own. And so we, we, we didn't bring a lot of food from Israel, and we are, the water that we are drinking is water from Israel. I have, it's not here next to me now, but in any case, every, from water to the food, the morning, everything is, was brought from Israel. And there were a few days in which we bought um, local fruits. Um, but since last Friday, um, some radioactive material was found in the water in this area, in the region where we are. So since then, we are extremely close with that as well. So. Just one. <laughs> you look great. Uh, well, Dr. Marin, you are uh, one of our uh, Medal of Valor awardees. You're a famous physician from Shari Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem. I hope that they don't mind you keep taking time off uh, for the world's uh, hotspots. But can you talk a little bit more globally for you and the team? Uh, we live now in a world that uh, a huge uh, upheaval across the Middle East, big issues, big problems, plenty of challenges right back in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. Why Why are you guys there? Well, it, it can go into different ways. I must say that um, in my hospital I have a few hats, but one of them I'm in charge for the mass preparedness of the hospital, bringing us casualty events. We left Israel on Motsai Shabbat on a Saturday night. On Wednesday, three days before that, there was a, a bombing in Jerusalem with uh, 20 something uh, wounded people arriving uh, to where uh, Sharon said I was responsible for arranging the, the preparedness of the hospital for that. On Thursday, a day after that, we had a big drill in Sharon said that was planned a month ahead. And of course, no one thought that there would be a real uh, event, but we did treat this uh, massive bombing in Jerusalem. We did do the drill, uh, and two days later, I uh, left. Um, there, there are two perspectives to this. I think uh, the importance of our mission from the global uh, way is, is, goes far beyond what uh, the exact number of people that we see here. Japan, as we were speaking, is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a country that's usually not used to formulate even a law against foreigners giving medical treatment inside Japan. So they made a way that we will be able to work now. I think this is this is, is a crucial point. This is a crucial importance of our work here, because you know these these mass mass disasters happen anywhere around the globe. No country can really cope by its own with these disasters. So once you open the borders, which is of course way beyond the, the medical treatment goes way beyond difference in cultures or difference in borders. 
mean, when countries will be able to cooperate on these things, that's the only way that a devastated country will, will be able to cope in the first few weeks. And Japan is, of course, one of the strongest and healthiest economics in the world. And even Japan could use some help, and I think from this perspective, I think this is this is the really importance of our of our, of our job, look, looking at it in, in a global way. Um, Israel, about four months ago, had um, a big fire in the Carmel Mountains, and, and I must say that we were very happy to get help from a lot of countries around us, say, from Jordan, from Turkey, from Greece, and I'm sure there are much more to first country that pop into my head from Russia as well. This is the way the world has to go. I mean, looking at these disasters in a global way, I, mean, I think this is the way that we can play our share. Well, in closing, let me just say to the people who will be watching this uh, YouTube around the world, um, uh, I see that you're wearing your Israeli uh, uniform. You're an officer in the IDF, and I think it's a uh, a fantastic statement on, on behalf of all the people, on behalf of the uh, Israel Defense Forces as well. Really awakening the spirit of um, humanitarianism around the world and uh, making us all proud. Uh, proud of a fellow Jew, proud of the Israeli uh, community, the government, and yes, proud of, uh, ID, of the IDF. Who knows, maybe someday you'll be able to treat Richard Goldstone. If you have someone there who can help on the psychiatric end of things, but uh, we just want to again uh, commend you and the entire crew. Um, who knows? You may have to prepare for a return trip. You uh, you might have to pick up a second medal. But as far as we're concerned, you've lived up uh, already to everything that. Um, the Wiesenthal Center and Shari Tzedek and the Jewish people know about you and the team. This is uh, really a sanctification of everything that it means to be a Jew. We're very proud of you. Stay safe, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, and thank you for the honor last year and the honor now talking to you. Thank you very much. All the best. Kol Tuv.